Welcome to Opalest TV. I'm in New York together with Simon Legg. Simon is the founder of SL Capital Advisors and he has a very interesting story to tell. Simon, tell me what is your personal history and how did you get involved with hedge funds? I spent 23 years at JP Morgan. So I spent about two thirds of that time in trading and fixed income and foreign exchange trading and about a third of that time in hedge fund investing where I ran a seed capital business. So my whole career has been trading, managing traders, managing interest rate derivatives and foreign exchange, and also investing in hedge funds and negotiating deals with new hedge funds. So that's really been my career. Now, at the JP Morgan directly, let's dissect into this time. You said you were first um, allocating to hedge funds mm -hmm. and then you started to invest in hedge funds and sure. really be taking stakes in hedge funds. Tell us more about those different phases. So in 1994, I, I joined the bank's investment committee which allocated its own capital to hedge funds, about a billion dollars in capital, to many of the best hedge funds around at the time. And of course hedge funds were still a small business, not really well known outside of the private banking world. So that was my first exposure to hedge funds. And I was still running the trading business at the time, so hedge fund investing wasn't my day job. It was probably half a day a week, something like that, in a meeting. And then in 2001, I set up the seeding business to really provide venture capital financing to new hedge funds. And that was because we felt that the dot-com collapse and all of the money institutional clients were losing in their traditional investments would cause a lot of demand for hedge funds. And we felt the money was in the business of hedge funds. And so we set up a business to provide capital to new managers, to tomorrow's stars, and to get a piece of the business for our clients and for JP Morgan. And so I did that from really 2001 until I retired from the bank in 2009. Tell us more about your company, SL Capital. What do you do now? So SL Advisors runs all separately managed accounts. So we don't actually run a fund. All of the clients have access to their own capital and visibility and transparency and ownership. And the thrust of the business is about generating income in a world of negative real rates on bonds. And so in every developed country in the world, interest rates are lower than inflation. I think the prospect of that's gonna continue for many years. And yet investors still need income. They still look for sources of income. I mean, every investor you could talk to will recognize that's an issue. So we run strategies that focus on generating income, but without using conventional fixed income securities to do that. So how do you do that? So we have three different strategies that do that. One is uh, called uh, MLPs, Master Limited Partnerships, which are energy infrastructure businesses. And, and it's, a, it's a great asset class for, certainly for US taxable investors. The yields are around five to 6%, and you're investing in pipelines, in storage facilities, in transportation. And these businesses don't pay corporate income tax, so they have a lower cost of capital than traditional corporations. In addition, they have very steady distribution growth. So typically you're earning between five and 6% in distributions, but then they grow between four and 6% a year. So you're looking at between you know 10 to 12% total return on those securities. So that's one sector that we run. Another strategy is we invest in high dividend yielding stocks. So stocks with low beta, less risk than the market, a long history of paying reliable dividends. And we run that strategy both hedged and unhedged. The hedge strategy is quite interesting because those companies and their firms like Procter and Gamble and J and J and Kraft and not companies that you're going to wake up tomorrow and worry about, you know, are they still in business or not? Really stable, boring companies because it should look boring on a day-to-day -day basis. We hedge the strategy to be beta neutral, although we're exploiting a weakness in capital asset pricing model, which is that low beta stocks tend to do better than high beta stocks. They tend to outperform on a risk adjusted basis. So we eliminate the market risk by being beta neutral, but then we pick up that inefficiency in the capital asset pricing model. So we run that strategy, that's about a 6% per year type return. We also run that as a long only strategy. And then we run a deep value equity strategy, which is probably 20 to 25 names, companies with low debt that are cheap to intrinsic value. All separately managed accounts, you know, we don't use any leverage or anything like that. It's completely transparent to our clients. Tell us about your client base. You know, I set up the business three years ago. And so initially with my own money, which, right. uh, you know, which I was managing. And so the clients that we have right now are largely high net worth investors, 
you know, we've had a, a very sort of a passive marketing approach. So the clients are basically friends of mine who said, you know, Simon put me into this strategy or please manage my portfolio for me. And so that's essentially how the business is growing. How have your three funds or your three managed accounts, your three strategies been performing? They're all doing fine. You know, MLPs typically does 10 to 12 percent a year. You know, this year we're up about uh, 9 percent. MLPs were flat in the first half of the year and had a pretty good bounce back in July and August. Deep value equity strategies up around 13 percent for the year and historically has outperformed the equity market since we ran that. And the hedge dividend capture strategy, the high dividend yielding stocks, the unhedged version is probably up around 5 or 6%, about half of the equity market, which is about what we'd expect. The hedged version is outperforming the hedge fund market neutral index, but is around flat for the year because dividend yielding stocks have been underperforming the market a little bit. But the strategies are all doing pretty well. We're happy with the results. You also wrote a book, and there is some controversy also about the book, and I'm very excited to talk with you about the hedge fund mirage, mm -hmm. right? Uh, a book that steered a lot of controversy in hedge fund land. Tell us, uh, you are, of course, a real veteran when it comes to hedge funds, mm -hmm. and through your seeding approach, you really got to understand even better than a lot of investors the inner workings and the economics of running a hedge fund. Mm -hmm. Now, wh what did you find and what did you write about in your book? Yeah, so what I found was that hedge fund investors haven't done as well as traditionally believed in hedge funds. And without doubt, there's great hedge funds and happy clients. But on average, the average dollar invested in hedge funds would have been better off invested in treasury bills. And the industry did really well in the 90s. Hedge fund investors made a lot of money in the 90s. There just weren't that many of them. And as the industry grew and assets came in, the returns became steadily worse. And so I think that what's important is for investors to look at hedge fund returns based on an asset weighted or an internal rate of return basis because size is a real factor for the hedge fund industry. It's a factor for individual managers. Small hedge funds do better than big ones. Big hedge funds generally did better when they were smaller. The same is true for the hedge fund industry. And so investors really need to look at how any hedge fund or the industry indeed as a whole has done as assets have flowed in. And there's a very clear negative correlation between asset size and performance. What I wrote about fees have without doubt taken a, a substantial chunk of the returns that, that have been generated. And hedge funds have been fantastic investments, it's just unfortunately most of those returns have gone to the managers as opposed to the clients. Tell me about the feedback that you had been receiving from the book. You know, it's almost all very positive. The financial press coverage has been just terrific. I mean, all the mainstream financial press has, has, has written about it and give it, given us good coverage. People in the hedge fund industry have been very positive. And it's amazing how many hedge fund managers I've talked to who've said to me, you know what, Simon, you're right, the industry is full of mediocrity. Of course, my fund is good, but you know, the rest of them are pretty bad. And this is because hedge fund managers are not the villains in this. Hedge fund managers don't promote the hedge fund industry. Hedge fund managers promote their own hedge fund. And that's perfectly legitimate. So I've had a lot of very positive feedback. You know, the, the hedge fund lobbying group in London, the Alternative Investment Managers Association, has taken issue with the book. And, and they've uh, had a couple of shots this year at writing rebuttals of it. I think that people generally recognize that while AIM is making the case that hedge funds are good, investors are sort of grappling every day with the fact that the results are bad and they continue to be bad and, and so I think the, you know, the empirical evidence is sort of overwhelming whatever theory they may have. So the feedback's been great, it's been a lot more fun to be a little bit controversial than I might have expected. I speak at industry conferences, yes. so when you ask me how the industry has responded, one of the things I've probably left out is, um, you know, I, I get invited to speak at hedge fund conferences, believe it or not, and uh, the hedge fund industry is very receptive to the message because two trillion dollar industry is not going to go away because of my book and I think that a lot of the most talented investment managers run hedge funds because that's where the money is so the really challenge for the clients is to access that talent on better terms than they have in the past and so so my book was really aimed at the clients of hedge funds as opposed to the industry as a whole and I think that a lot of people in the hedge fund industry recognize that 
they need to change and adapt to a world of zero interest rates and a world of two trillion dollars in hedge fund assets to ensure that the clients get the types of returns and risk profile that they've been led to expect. And so the, really the feedback to the industry has been very, very constructive. So you have been investing with hedge funds since 1994 and you described some of the changes that you witnessed within the industry and mm -hmm. one of them is um, the size and the ballooning. What else can you observe, did you observe and can you share with us about the changes in the industry? Well I think there's a lot more equity market risk in the industry than there was before and if you look at 2000 to 2002, hedge funds did a fantastic job. They preserved capital, they hedged, they made money when equities were going down, you know, very strongly for two years. You go forward to 2008 and hedge funds lost a lot of money just like everything else. And that's because the industry was so much bigger that to deploy all that capital, inevitably, they wind up with more equity type exposure than they had traditionally. And I think that's the big change is that hedge funds are far more correlated with equity markets today than they were 10 years ago. Well, and at the same time, we have the issue that actually now over the past five years, it's institutions going into hedge funds for diversification sure. issues or for in the search for return or alpha, et cetera. What do you see there? What should institu institutions do instead? I think the way institutions should approach the industry is like this. Conventionally, a diversified portfolio of assets is a smart way if you want to get the return on that asset class. This is, you know, Finance 101, diversification is the only free lunch. You can invest in equities and have no insight into stock picking and just have an index fund. With hedge funds, manager selection is absolutely critical. The average investor in hedge funds has done worse than treasury bills. Therefore, the only way to win as a hedge fund investor is to be good at picking managers. You have to be better than average. If that's the case, you don't actually want a diversified portfolio. You're not trying to get the industry return. You want to let your skill at manager selection really work for you. So in fact, I think the intelligent way to use hedge funds is to just have two or three hedge funds rather than 10 or 20. Of course, if you have two or three hedge funds, you can't put 20% of your assets in hedge funds. You should put you know, one or 2% in hedge funds and just go where you have high conviction and you know, a manager whose strategy you understand and where the terms make sense for you. So unfortunately, I don't believe that hedge funds at their current size are gonna solve the sort of pension shortfall issue that so many pension funds in the US and in Europe are facing. But there are some great hedge funds. It's just that you know, there's not as many as people might think. What else do you recommend for investors today? I think for any investor looking at their sort of traditional asset allocation between equities, fixed income, and cash or alternatives, I think that what's really compelling is to look at that fixed income allocation and to take it down as low as you, know, as, as low as you reasonably can. And this is because public policy in the US, within the Eurozone, and in Japan is clearly to keep interest rates below inflation. It's to force negative real returns on investors. And that's one way of sort of undoing all of the negative impact of all of the debt buildup that we had in the previous you know, 10, 20 years. So as long as governments are manipulating interest rates and keeping them artificially low, investors should respond by coming out of that market. And so you know, there's, a, there's a terrific statistic. You could have $100 in 10-year treasuries, which today yield around 1.8%. You could take that $100 out and you could put $20 in the S&P 500, which yields around two, put $80 in cash in treasury bills yielding zero. You've got this 80-20 portfolio. The $20 in the S&P 500 over 10 years, as long as you get 4% dividend growth, the last 50 years has been 5%, 4% dividend growth, unchanged dividend yields in 10 years, that $20 in the S&P 500 will give you the same return as the $100 in 10-year treasuries and you've kept $80 in cash, which may at some point earn a return or you may find something else to invest in. That's how wrong interest rates are today. That's how distorted the credit markets are. So my feeling is, you know, if governments around the world want to own bonds that badly, let them own the lot and, and step away. So that's the fundamental challenge, I think, for investors is to get the asset allocation right and to minimize their fixed income allocation and have some mixture of equities and cash depending on their risk appetite and stay away from what is essentially a market that's really overpriced.
Simon, how is SL Advisors different from a hedge fund? Well, of course, we don't run a fund. The writer of the hedge fund, Mirage, couldn't exactly run a hedge fund. So everything is separately managed accounts. So the clients have complete transparency and visibility around their assets, ownership of the assets. They can take their money back anytime they want. They can see the trades being done. If investors want to look at the P&L during the day, they can do that. We don't charge two and 20. We don't charge hedge fund fees. So everything we do in our business is consistent with how, in my book, we recommend investors approach the hedge fund industry, which is to look for transparency and access to capital and fees that are fair and fair terms. We also uh, write a lot. You know, I write a monthly newsletter. Uh, I write a blog. We post research talking about ideas that we have, investments that we've made. People can go back and look at what we said six months ago. It's still up there on the internet. So if they choose to spend the time, they can go back and look at what's in the public domain and really get a good sense for our philosophy and themes that we like. And they can see ideas that didn't work because once I've written it, it's up there. So if I did something stupid a year ago, it's still going to be up there. So it's open. And I think that's how a business should be run. It's open. The clients can see what we're doing with the capital. They can see our thought process. And so we're a registered investment advisor, so we're allowed to basically, you know, publish uh, investment research. So that's yeah. what we do. So summing it up again, what would be your recommendations for the hedge fund industry? I think the hedge fund industry needs to be cognizant of the limits on size. So if you're a consultant recommending a hedge fund allocation to a big pension fund, recognize the constraints that size places on the return profile for hedge funds. I mean. I chaired a panel at a conference recently where I, all the panel members agreed that 7% was their long-term return expectation for hedge funds. On $2 trillion, that's $140 billion a year in trading profit, and that's after fees. It's about $200 billion a year before fees. And the problem with that is that the hedge fund industry has never made $200 billion for its clients except in 2009, but it lost half a trillion dollars the year before. So $200 billion in annual profit is, is most likely not sustainable for the hedge fund industry. And I think that investors should recognize that they should look for strategies that are off the beaten track, that are niche, that are sort of not so well covered, less efficient, where the returns are likely to be higher. I think the problem today is so many investors want yesterday's returns with today's risk. And I think it's a, it's a tough combination to get that to work. So I think investors need to be more willing to invest the way we did in the 90s, which is with strategies that were inefficient, but were hard to get your hands around, not well followed, probably were more risky, but had less competition. And so the returns tended to be higher.